to Richard Perkins. Uh, Richard is an innovative market garden farmer, internationally regarded teacher and influencer, and a regenerative agriculture expert. He's author of the internationally acclaimed manual, Regenerative Ar Agriculture and Making Small Farms Work. Uh, he's worked professionally in every major climate zone across several continents, consulting on various projects, farms and industry, and is known for his pragmatic, no-nonsense approach to profitable systems design. And he's now focused uh, on his own farm, which is in Sweden. Uh, Richard, you're very welcome. Greetings from Ireland. Thank you so much for joining us. And I'm going to hand it over to you now. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, everyone, at Biofarm 2020 for inviting me. I'm going to jump into the slides here and hopefully we will get through the no dig market gun element of our farm and have time for some questions and answers with you. So we're actually a mixed farm up at 59 degrees north and it's quite a challenging climate, although I guess a lot of you in Ireland would say the same about your own climate. Indeed, most farmers all over the world will claim their climate is the most challenging place to farm. Uh, but we're a mixed farm, but I've been asked today to talk about the commercial viability of no dig growing. And so I want to address that today. We're, for those that don't know about our farm, it's a mixed farm. We do pasture poultry, particularly egg laying hens and meat chickens, turkeys. And we have sideline enterprises that include uh, beef and sheep and forest raised pigs. Uh, but market gardening is one of the three primary enterprises that we generate income from alongside the pasture poultry. And so it's a very small farm and I'll tell you about what I think is the best approach for small scale veg production. This is a 10 hectare farm, but actually we're farming primarily four and a half hectares of the land. It's, we benefit here in Sweden from very cheap land. We bought this farm seven years ago now for about 90,000 euros. And we invested just a little bit more than that to set up the farm. And yet we can turn over more than that combined sum every six months of the production season, which runs in our short summer and we have a very long winter here. So we actually shut down the market gardens 10 days ago and they won't get planted up again until April next year. So we benefit from this long winter break here. We designed up a farm that would work well into the future based primarily on grass and tree crops, perennial crops, because these are the long living sustainable systems, but they're hard to pay back uh, a farm with and hard to create a cash flow with. So we decided to cash flow our plan by using pasture poultry, which obviously relies on imported grains, but that boosts our fertility and turns what was perhaps the worst pasture in the village to what is now some of the best pasture. And we basically spent seven years 3D printing that design onto our landscape. We have uh, quite a popular YouTube channel where I've documented a 25 centimeter increase in the 90% rooting depth on our pasture in just four short years through key line plowing and planned grazing. I believe you've been talking about Alan Savory and holistic plant grazing. That's something we do with our animals here. And so radical changes to the ecosystem and just hearing from Sean then about uh, the words from Gabe Brown, uh, sorry, uh, the words from Greg Judy, I've witnessed the exact same thing where you bring a species onto the landscape and it creates the conditions for seven more to coexist. We have beavers, wolves, elk, deer, and all kinds of predator species moving back into this landscape. We have three pairs of nesting birds, uh, birds of prey, I should say, that have moved onto the farm. And one day farmers will have the broad enough and long enough foresight to start measuring success in how well the predator species are doing. And that may be a far cry from how we manage land today, but that's my perspective. It's a challenging climate though. We are three months frost free and that can sway 20 days either direction. We've had extreme weather events. We've all seen changing climatic conditions and farming is the industry that will be worst hit by that. But as you go further north or further south on the planet, those extremes become a lot less predictable and it's a pretty tough place to farm. But we figured if we can make this work here, then people could replicate these models all over. 
And so I stand for what I would define as regenerative agriculture based on a foundation of it must be soil building, i.e. carbon sequestering. And to do that, it needs to be managed holistically. And I'm referring there specifically to the work of Alan Savory and holistic management. I think that's probably the single biggest factor that's contributed to the very rapid development and profitability of our farm. And bear in mind, our farm is running without any government subsidies and is paying white collar salaries in a very challenging economic and climatic situation. We're doing this by mimicking ecosystem processes as far as we can to make inputs and outputs for the farm localized using as little oil, money or debt technology and infrastructure as possible. We farm without a tractor, for example. And we believe in certification by customers. So this for me is the basis of food security. When customers have a relationship with us directly, we skip the middlemen as it were, we can sell premium products to customers without anyone else taking a share of the profit. And we have some pretty interesting models for sales that I'll tell you about at the end of the presentation. And for me, this needs to be regenerating the land, but also the community and be profitable for us. It needs to be regenerative across the board, but it all comes back to soil building. Now that brings me around to market gardening. And I actually went to agricultural school in the UK where I'm from for organic crop production and horticulture. And I left there with more questions and answers. And after working on other people's vegetable productions for years, I decided I would never have anything to do with vegetables again. <laughs> and then started looking at alternatives with animal and perennial crop management. And so when we moved to the farm here, this was our front lawn. We actually just set up a no dig market garden just for homestead use. We had no intention of establishing a market garden because it was always the highest input, highest labor input, highest material input and lowest paid farm enterprise I'd ever encountered. But you can see here, this is how we initiated truly no dig beds. We actually put composted manure straight on what had been lawn for decades. And we actually only put, you see this okay. cardboard. Do not tell him. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Richard. Can you hear me? It's Ella here. Can yes. you, um, we're not seeing your slides. So can you share your screen and we'll just see if we can see your slides there, please. Okay. Have you missed all these slides? <laughs> yes. I think we might have, Richard. I'm really sorry. Yeah. We weren't hundred percent sure, but we'll, uh, we'll keep going from now. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay, sorry about that, folks. So yes, this is the the initial garden space as we are creating on our front lawn. So we had no intention of scaling it at that point. It was to produce vegetables for our family. And yeah, we're literally working straight onto the pasture with composted manure and using cardboard to to mark the pathways between the beds. And we've also created beds as we scaled this enterprise up commercially. We've also tilled beds and put them into no dig uh, cultivation in the same way. So what I'm talking about here is small scale biointensive vegetable production that I think would be suited up to four or 5,000 square meters of bed space. Beyond that, I would say that it's, you know, you're going to be outcompeted by machines. But on this scale, working with the right hand tools, we can outcompete any tractor if we're growing the right types of crops. Obviously, field scale potatoes is not something we're growing in this system. This is for higher value, sort of CSA, veg box, family weekly vegetable needs of high quality, high value. And so this is the north beds on our farm now so we have about 1500 square meters of actual bed space so it's very small but that drives a very high economy compared to any field scale crop and can provide one person with a annual white collar salary everything in these systems is standardized we have beds that are 10 meters long and 75 centimeters wide now all of the best market growers are working with these dimension beds, not necessarily the length, but the width, because the tools that have been uh, developed in the last decade that make hand grown vegetables economic and ergonomic, again, are all based around innovations from Elliot Coleman over in America, working on 30 inch bed structures. 
and the later developments from other people who have used that same dimension. And so we're planting crops very close together and using mulch essentially, but compost to feed the soil food web, but also to protect the soil. There's no bare ground in these systems. And just like nature leaves no bare soil, we want to do that in our veg production too. Because what I saw when I studied horticulture at agricultural school is that my feeling was that this hasn't really evolved in four or five decades. You know, it's just the same old thing. And we are just taught to till and damage soil in whatever scale it is, whether it's hand or tractor base. But there are massive implications for tillage, including waking up nearly all the plant pathogens that attack our crops. They're all heavily aerobic and they remain dormant in the ecosystem nearly all of the time for a very specific reason. And so when we till soil, we're not just aerating it, we're oxygenating, uh, sorry, we're oxidizing it. And that wakes up plant pathogens that we then need to use all kinds of strategies and chemicals typically to deal with. It also uh, destroys soil structure, leads to compaction. And so everything we've done with our vegetable production is trying to apply the best management and planning tools with the best soil care. And what it leaves us with is highly profitable, small scale intensive veg production that's very beautiful, very easily managed, uses far less water. And we've even closed the loops of our nutrient needs, our compost needs through the animals on our farm. Now that's only possible obviously on a mixed farm, but that's primarily what I advocate. But you see the benefit here of everything being standardized, everything's the same length. So all our row covers, and all of our bed applications like compost or chicken manure, it's the same for every single time we plant the crop. The spacings of the crops are always the same. So it makes this big task of managing a complex garden much simpler. We use very intensive spacings so that the plants close canopy very quickly. And therefore we have a layer of plants covering a layer of compost, armoring our soil. Just like we can do on pastures with some of the grazing management you've heard about during this conference, we're doing exactly the same with our vegetable production. And then when we take our crops and harvest them, we leave the roots in the ground because they make up a massive amount of biomass that feeds the soil food web. So what we like to do is put our attention and focus on the soil microbiology. And in turn, we get healthy crops that aren't attacked by insects and pests, etc. And so we're not focusing on growing lettuces, we're focusing on microbiology and growing soil, knowing that lettuces know how to grow themselves, as it were. I always like to joke that we take a lot of credit for things that we don't actually do. It's not very hard to grow a lettuce, it knows how to grow itself. And so we're just creating the natural conditions in the soil for it to thrive. So deciding what to grow is really important. Profitability of any crop is a factor of the time, space and yield per area and the harvest length and market demand of that crop. So these are just examples in our specific case where we are in Sweden, tomatoes you'll see are actually a low value crop because we have such a short season here. And by the time you pick the top of the plant to stop it growing, you've barely got any ripe tomatoes yet. So that would only work in a heated tunnel, but in our climate, heating a tunnel would be totally un uneconomic. And so this needs adapting to your specific time, place and circumstance. But generally, I would say the patterns are true. You have very high value crops that are quick turnover and you have lower value crops. But in reality, we need a balance of both. And so a good market garden will have a balance of both. A market garden that's not particularly financially viable, you will tend to find if you analyze their crop plan, they're growing mostly low value crops. So you need to have a good mix of both. Here, for example, is mescaline mix. It's just baby salad leaf mix. On this 10 meter beds, we can harvest 32 kilos in the first cut in 30 days, and then another 12 kilos two weeks later. That will net us 670 euros off one 10 meter bed that's 75 centimeters wide. And so it's a very uh, stacked way to grow vegetables very densely because we're not limited to spacing things apart like a, a tractor seeder would have to do. So on a bed like this, we grow 12 rows of baby carrots, which are actually worth more than six rows of main crop carrots uh, in about half the time. 
the important thing about growing market garden vegetables is you must have enough water. Now, a lot of you in Ireland, I guess, probably don't have an issue with that. <laughs> you might have the opposite issue. But it's important to sort the water out first because crop production is totally based on having the right amount of water. And you need typically about four centimeters of water a week for most crops. Some will need more and some will need less. We had to build uh, a pond to irrigate our market garden because we just didn't have, we're off grid here in Sweden. We didn't have enough well water to irrigate such a large area. I'm, I'm showing you this because this is incredible material if anyone needs to build water reserves. This is called geosynthetic clay liner or GCL liner. It's a layer of bentonite clay sandwiched between two layers of geotextile. It's typically sold in these rolls that are 40 by five meters long. And the beauty of the material is that it seals itself together. So the bentonite clay swells up under the pressure of the soil that's put back on top of it and it forms an impenetrable barrier. But if you do happen to penetrate it, it seals up around itself. So you can see we've put this overflow pipe in and you can see where we've overlapped two sheets and joined them together with bentonite powder. And that's all you need to do to seal this material. You then cover it with the topsoil and you can plant it out straight away. And six weeks after this photo, it looked like that. Now it's a functioning habitat that's got fish and ducks who are putting their manure in the water that's now irrigating our market garden at the top of the farm. But you must have your water planned out and installed before you start. I'll show you some of the basic tools and infrastructure we use. Now this is what it looks like outside when we're sowing most of our spring starts. It's minus 25, minus 30 often. And so we needed a very small heated space. Now, heated space is a premium in such a cold climate. And I'm trying to show you that everything we're doing on our farm is super low cost, using other people's waste as far as possible. This is actually a lean-to greenhouse dug into the ground to stop it freezing. And so we have water in there year round. And we've taken down the bulletproof glass from the Stockholm police station in, in exchange for taking it away for free. And so for 1500 euros, we've built this space that's heated by the wood stove in our house and remains at about 18 degrees year round, which is the perfect temperature for seed starts. And you see we're using the vertical space to maximize the amount of starts we can fit in here in a small, expensive, relatively expensive heated space. We're using all these trays are modular. So we have 40 by 40, 40 by 60, and 40 by 120 trays so that we can just stack everything as tightly as possible in this small space. And we're transplanting everything possible because it saves us a lot of time. We've been playing more recently with this paper pot tool. This is a very rapid seeding and transplanting system where you have a drop seeder. I can put 250 seeds in place in less than a minute per tray. And then they go under lights because we have no light here in Sweden during the winter months. There's not enough light to grow our seedlings in March, for example. And then that goes out with this transplanter tool so we can plant out four rows of spring onions like this in a matter of three minutes or so. So very effective tools that are low cost and they make working by hand more efficient than working by a machine actually could be. We use a broad fork. And this shank that's lying between the board fork is the key line plow shank that we use to renovate our pastures along with holistic plant grazing. But I would say the board fork is a, a human powered key line plow. We've used this for about three years and then it basically has no function on our farm anymore. And most people I've seen, students of ours that have started No Dig have experienced the same, where this is used to decompact the subsoil in the beginning because the beds that we're working on are compacted heavy clays that they used to park forestry machinery on. And so we use this to break up the subsoil without turning the soil over. So whilst you could say this is a, it's tillage, it's nothing like digging the soil over. We're not oxygenate, uh, sorry, we're not oxidizing the soil. We're not breaking its structure. We're just allowing air and water down into the deeper subsoil and that allows plants to root deeper. Wherever plants root, they release polysaccharides, short chain carbohydrates, i.e. life happens. So we're able to build deeper topsoils radically by 
using this tool as a temporary decompaction measure in the beginning. That has no function on our farm anymore. If I put that into any of our beds, you just don't feel any resistance. And so at that point, you know you don't need it anymore. But using the right tool, so here's a 75 centimeter rake. Well, that doesn't seem so special perhaps, but if you take a, a typical rake that's half the width, you take twice as long as me to do the same job. And on a farm, factors of two make up a rather large difference. Imagine finishing your work day at midday. We use a simple bed roller. This is a tool that both compacts the surface very slightly for better germination with cedars and also marks the rows for even transplanting so that you could use tools like stirrup hose for effective weeding. We actually rarely do any weeding on our farm because this no dig approach just has smothered out all weeds. We get a few tree seeds that are germinating that have blown in on top, but we've virtually eliminated all annual and perennial weeds. Bear in mind, this was pasture underneath. We have cooch grass, horsetail, dandelions, buttercups, etc. but they've just been smothered. And that the use of wood chip in the pathway is extremely beneficial. And this model now has been taken by hundreds of farmers that we've taught and been tried out all over the world now. And I know that there's some of our students active in Ireland doing this. And it's real benefit for soaking up excess moisture. This field that's in the picture now had standing water on it every spring. And now it's just completely dry. So the crops are clean, your boots are clean, it keeps morale up, it's very beautiful. And that's part of the marketing of the farm. This is the first thing you see when you drive into our farm. And if a market garden looks crispy clean and crops look healthy, that translates into our, probably our eggs are the best eggs too. We use very simple seeding tools. This is a six row seeder from Johnny's. So we can walk up and down at walking speed, planting 12 rows of carrots in a matter of a minute or two. And there's hacks for this tool. So you basically don't need to adjust any of the settings. But as I said, we'll try and transplant everything possible. We also use a Jang seeder sometimes. This is a higher precision single row seeder. But simple tools that are low cost and pay themselves back in time savings immediately. This is another one. This is the farmer's friend's quick cut greens harvester. We have a little video of it here. This is a $600 tool that saves itself you know, it saves its cost in a matter of a few days in the cutting season. It can be used for harvesting microgreens. And so these are the tools that really make market gardening enjoyable and fun again. We're using simple low cost refrigeration techniques. This is a cool bot. It's a little piece of hardware with a little bit of software that can override an AC unit and turn it into a chiller. So rather than having an expensive walk-in cooler with a, a high energy consuming compressor, we built a 20 cubic meter chiller for our market garden for 1500 euros, including the building itself. So lots of great strategies for low cost startups. Using the right tools in the top left, you see push cut knives. This is for harvesting things like salads so that you avoid the unergonomic stretching around a plant with your wrist, which if you do 20,000 times a year, will end up destroying your joints pretty quickly. So there are correct tools for the correct jobs. And we like to keep those tools right in the middle of the garden. So these are our tool boards. They have a simple roof to keep them dry. And the tools are right in the middle of the garden where you want them so that we minimize the amount of time walking backwards and forwards across the farm. A lot of farm vehicle and people use is just moving around, finding things that have been put in a funny place, etc. We do a lot with season extension where we are because obviously our season is so short, so tunnels within tunnels. And these fleeces, which are common all over the world, are the cheapest, quickest way to change your microclimate. They will, so a simple fleece like this, we use both 20 and 40 gram per square meter fleeces. And we used four millimeter galvanized wire cut into one and a half meter strips, which is the perfect length to make an arch over a 75 centimeter bed. This will increase the temperature inside by about four degrees Celsius. And if you do that inside a tunnel, then you're jumping up two climate zones, which in our climate is incredibly significant. 
Another thing that we've been developing here with a UK manufacturer is these caterpillar tunnels. So we are the only people that sell these in Europe, I believe. And so these are very low cost, movable poop houses. And you can see that caterpillar shape is, is the string that holds the material down. They're incredibly robust. We get uh, very intense windstorms here. And we've had these up for years with no problem. And that's something we sell to growers all over Europe as a very low cost way for doing season extension. And they come in all kinds of lengths and they're specifically manufactured to cover four of our no dig beds width wise in the standard dimensions of beds that we've been talking about. And so we use pretty much, this is what you're looking at now is our pest and disease management. This is insect netting, small enough for uh, flea beetles. And the other main problem that we have here is cabbage butterflies. We don't use any toxins in our garden. We sometimes have used diatomaceous earth, it's fossilized diatoms that are, it's kind of like a talcum powder. It's like dust that's a razor blade structure on a microscopic level that cuts the exoskeleton of small um, bugs. But that's basically all we use in our gardens. And what we found is if you focus your attention on healthy soil, you get healthy plants and healthy plants don't get attacked by insects so easily. The only disease we've seen in our gardens is rust spots on beet leaves. And so that's not very, it's not really a problem at all. And so this is how the garden looks. It's squeaky clean, and weed free. And then we have a nice interaction here with our laying hens. So we have these eggmobiles that are moving daily on the pasture in the summer, but in the winter, those birds need to go inside. They go in the polytunnel and we build up a deep litter system. We use straw and peat moss to act as a carbonaceous nappy for their high strength manure. And then they are culled at the end of the season for stewing birds and making stock, et cetera. And we'll take a new flock of birds in. And then we will take out that bedding and further compost it down. And that supplies about 50 cubic meters of compost that closes the nutrient cycle of that enterprise and provides us with enough compost for our entire market garden. That gets composted down and turned a few times. And then in this space is growing a thousand tomato plants in the summer. So multi-use infrastructure, this one structure is producing a thousand tomato plants all summer and about 40,000 euros of eggs during the winter time. One important piece of infrastructure is a washing and packing station. In this case, it acts as a garage for our cars in the winter. And then in the summer, everything folds down and we have our wash pack station. So on the left in the top, Veg comes bunched and crated to the wash station and someone runs the wash station, washes down vegetables and the chiller is just to the right hand side of this photo. And so vegetables have a one way flow very quickly into the chiller. And then when things are chilled, they're brought out onto this packing bench that you see here and they're packed into their orders and they're in insulated boxes, these kanga boxes you see here. And so then the van comes and pulls up straight up to them and within about 30 minutes they're with customers. So that means we don't need to have an insulated vehicle, uh, sorry, a, a refrigerated vehicle. We can deliver really fresh, crispy vegetables at very low cost. These are restaurant orders. Some of our biggest customers have been restaurants that are quite close by. In that case, we can just take them in standard gray food crates and drop them straight off. Although we've lost a lot of restaurant customers this year, but luckily with the COVID situation, the private uh, sector has had a massive increase in demand in vegetables that I've been speaking to farmers all over Europe this summer. And it's typical to see two to 300% increase in sales this year with the COVID situation, which is very promising and great to hear. Then that's lean to greenhouse space that I showed you. We also use for microgreen production in the summer months and in the winter months when there are no fresh vegetables in Sweden, there's only storage crops. Microgreens are one of the most profitable things you could do per square meterage in any farm enterprise if you've got the market to sell them. We grow the simplest ones that all have a similar turnaround time. 
So these are the seeding and yield uh, data for pea sprouts. And so this tray, each one of these trays nets about 44 euros within two weeks. And we use radish, which does about the same. And we also grow sunflower, which is a little bit more profitable. And we have enough uh, space just in that lean to greenhouse that you could drive someone's annual income just from that. In, now, where we live, we're in the middle of nowhere in rural Sweden, so we can't sell that many. We do about 10,000 euros a year of microgreens. But if you live near a bigger city, this is a great enterprise for someone with a limited land base or even an urban land base. That's that quick cut greens harvester that's got a piece of uh, metal angle that adapts it for microgreen harvesting, makes it very efficient. So a great sideline part to go alongside uh, market gardening. And then that feeds back into the layer enterprise. So they get all of the trays in the winter time when there's no pasture for those birds to forage. So this is a little summary of what the market garden looks like. Now our enterprise is uh, about 28,000 euros of investment, but bear in mind, we had to build that whole pond and irrigation system, which costs a fair amount. So probably about 20,000 euros is a good budget for getting going with market gardening. And on 1,500 square meters of bed space and 300 meters of tunnel space, we can turn up to 60,000 euros off that. And we can net up to 45, 50,000 euros. The costs are very low once you're started. The running costs are down to seed. There's about 1,000 euros. Replacing row covers and other things like that every three or four years. And then there's your labor costs. But this is based on one one very good grower could manage a garden space like this, or two working 60% would be more easeful. And further south, we have students down in Germany that are netting 40,000 euros per thousand square meters. And I would say, you know, up to 70 euros a square meter uh, I've seen in Europe. So obviously when you've got a six or eight month growing season, you've got a lot more um, CSA shares or markets to run, whatever it is. But the economy looks really great if it's managed at this level of intensity. And that's the key, I think, is setting up no dig beds in the correct way in the beginning to minimize all future inputs. And then the maintenance needs of those beds are very low. So for example, we put a lot of compost down in the beginning, mainly to smother out weeds and get the soil biology pumping. And then we put a maintenance amount on in the future. So currently we put about 150 liters per 10 meter bed per year. So it's not a huge amount and we produce way more than our needs now just from our poultry enterprise. So lots of potential, but then it's very easy to grow veg. Selling veg is at least half the work. And so I'll tell you quickly a bit how we approach sales from our farm. The first thing we did when we started our farm is we started running open days to invite the local community. And this idea of keeping the farm gate open to invite people into the farm to explain why, because the people interested in the integrity food movement, they're interested in your story. They're interested in why you're doing this. And like why aren't you just following the conventional route? Why are you putting all this extra effort and care in? And it's that why that people are buying essentially. But this is the basis of food security in my mind is having a direct relationship to customers because now they know you and they understand when things don't go to plan or they understand things that you just don't, you know, farmers that are farming the commodity market don't have any flexibility or option. Here we get to set the price, we get to set the trends, we get to inform and educate our customers and open up new pathways in their thinking and in their cuisines. So we've always brought people onto the farm and given our time to educating them, get them crawling around, smelling the soil, tasting things, looking at the bugs in cow manure and people get genuinely excited about it. You know, grandparents and their kids have incredible time with us. And that's a way that we started building up email lists and customer bases. And we started selling everything through CSA or pre-sales. 
So in the top left here, you see what we called the ridge dollar. And the original Swedish currency was a dollar and we're called Ridgedale Farm. So it was a play on this Swedish currency. And that was the way that we pre-sold meat chickens. So you would exchange money for this coupon and we would give you a chicken somewhere later in the year. And we gave the customers the dates that we had produced them. And that allowed us to produce exactly the amount of birds we had already sold. And so we didn't produce too few or too many. Same with eggs, we sell our eggs on three month subscriptions. You can have a tray of 30 every week. You can have five trays of 30 a week, but you need to buy them every set interval for three months. So we're trying to get customers to meet us halfway. It's like we can produce the better quality food than you can buy in any store, but meet us halfway because we're busy and we're probably busier than you because we're farmers. And we did the same with our vegetables. We set up a CSA initially, and then we would invite people to the farm and show them what they could do with the produce. We've always had a farm chef here. And that's also a really good way to create bonds and get good feedback. A lot of CSAs will just write to their customers an email, ask them how it was. You don't get real feedback like that. You get real feedback when you sit with a glass of wine, looking at someone in the eye and you have a conversation. So that's something we've done from the beginning. Now we did all this through drop-off points. So we, the funniest stories were, we used to do it in McDonald's car parks. So we would turn up in a McDonald's car park at six at night in the dark winter nights like this, and just be opening up the doors and there's, there's pastured eggs and pastured chickens. It was beautiful. But then what's happened across Scandinavia and some of our students have taken to America and Canada and South Africa now, is this trend called Rico Rings. And this is entirely run by Facebook. I believe uh, actually there's a farm, Moy Hill Farm in Ireland has set up the first Rico in Ireland. And so Rico is a pre-sold farmer's market run entirely on Facebook. And it was set up by a Finnish man, Thomas Snellman. And it's incredibly effective. Now we set up the Rico rings around us. We're part of four Rico rings here. And now we put all of our sales through Rico rings. And what it means is that every producer that's in the group writes a list each week of what they've got for sale, how much it costs. People say, yep, yeah, I want a chicken. I want a veg box, whatever it is. And then we show up in a one hour window in the summer and a 30 minute window in winter. So we can come along with 5,000 euros of product, drop it off in 30 to 60 minutes flat and get back to the farm to do the chores we've got to do. It's incredibly efficient. I highly recommend checking it out. There are some resources. I've put videos about it on YouTube detailing you know, how to go about setting one up in your area. And it, it needs a critical mass. You need a diversity of producers. And, and what we found is that when we invited other farmers to come and stand with us at the drop-off points that we had started, they weren't really interested because it just seemed a bit unconventional. But when it all came along through the Rico heading, suddenly all those farmers jumped in and it just brought all of their customers to us. Now, we have our biggest drop-off point in the town of 70,000 people, uh, about 50 kilometers away, which is that's the furthest we're willing to sell our products. Now there are 13,000 people out of that town of 70,000 have joined the Rico ring. So they've individually gone on Facebook to join that group actively. They're not all shopping there all the time, but they've consciously gone and joined that group. So it's like one in five people has, you know, exposure to our incredible products. And so it's highly efficient and that's the way we now sell everything and I hope you can find out more about that online if you're interested in that. I think I'll leave it there. There's obviously a million things we could talk about. We often run week-long trainings in Nodig Market Gardening. There's a lot of information on our YouTube channel. I wrote a book called Regenerative Agriculture that details the market garden alongside everything else we're doing in a lot of detail. And yeah, I'm open to, to take some questions. Thanks, Richard. That was really fascinating. Uh, amazing to hear some of the stuff. I feel like you could keep going, but we're going to take a few questions. We've had quite a few questions coming in uh, from various viewers. Um, Sean Gilligan asks, can, can fruit and nut trees be incorporated into a market garden? I mean, presumably the answer is yes, absolutely. 
Definitely. I, maybe not nut trees, but I, my actual ideal model market garden would be groups of 10 beds with high intensity orchard and berry crops in beds in between blocks of 10 beds that fit a logical rotation. And definitely bringing back that diversity around the garden is a useful thing. Why not? Uh, I, would, I would do that myself, but this is our neighbor's land that we garden on mainly, so we're not allowed to plant trees there. And, and why not nut trees? Well, maybe hazel and hybrid hazel, but most of the nut trees are too large that they will overshadow the garden pretty oh. quick. Okay, so yeah. the spacing. Uh, Chris Kingham said, if one was intending to use chickens to enrich ground and polytunnel, what percentage of eggs do hens lay in the winter in polytunnel compared to the rest of the year? Well, we're up at 95% lay with these uh, Lohman hens. So from April, when they come into lay until end of November, mid-December, they're laying at 95%. That will go down and it tapers all the way down through the winter and it averages out about 85 83% across the whole year, and then we will cull them end of April. But bear in mind our winter is a lot more intense than yours, so you would need to speak to producers in Ireland or in your local area, because that will differ. It's, it's very much based on light and light intensity. Yes, yes. Um, and uh, just a quick question, is it possible to do what you're saying without some form of animals, some form of livestock? I mean, do you see them as, as an essential part of the market garden? Well, yes, it just might not be on your farm, but you know, the, the thing that I always like to draw people back to is there are simply no ecosystems on the planet that don't have animals. It's animals that drive fertility cycles. And that's important because, you know, most people aren't aware that nearly all veg production is based on animal manures. And if it's not, it's based on fossil fuels. And it's German broiler uh, manure that grows a lot of European vegetables. But if you're not producing animals yourselves, you're importing it from somewhere else. I think the beauty of a mixed farm, and if we look back at historical texts on how to plan farms from Cato and Plato, you know, two and a half thousand years ago, it, mixed farming has been how people have farmed forever. And there's a good reason for that. And it's the animals that drive that fertility system. And I, I, I would really say, you know, that it, I have a hard time including vegetable production in regenerative agriculture, as it were, because it's barely sustainable in my mind. I, I feel like vegetable production is certainly the least sustainable of all farm enterprises due to its inputs. And it, 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 you could only really call it regenerative as part of a closed loop farm, I think. That's um, my perspective. Uh, Davy McGovern has emailed in to ask, what is the compost on the beds made from? Does he vary it for different crops, for example, varying fungi bacteria ratios? No, well, nearly all compost is uh, bacterial dominated. You can't actually have a fungal dominated compost by mm. default. So you can have fungal orientated compost, but it's bacterial based. It's in, in our case, it's peat moss, which is, we have peat moss all around us. We own a peat swamp here, and it's cow manure and chicken manure. And then we will dress that with additional chicken manure for heavy feeders. So we have a crop rotation of heavy and light feeders, and we'll give additional uh, boiler manure to heavy feeding crops. Uh, David Leon asks, I mean, I suppose the answer is going to be yes, because of what you've just said, but is the no dig a market garden the solution for feeding our communities while capturing carbon? Well, you know, it, it's part of the solution, isn't it? Now, we all eat a bunch of grains and there's no-till approaches to producing grains, but, you know, there's a whole avenue over there too of perennial grains coming down the track and all kinds of things, but it's... I, I would, the future I want to grow old in and have my kids grow up in, I'd rather have a thousand small farms around the town than one big farm, you know, exporting products in the globalized system. And I think we need industrial farming, obviously. We're all addicted to grains and these kind of things, but certainly our standard weekly vegetable production could look very different, I think. But it needs a lot more people getting into farming in this manner. 
thought it was quite interesting what you spoke about, about the, uh, the, the extent to which you uh, talk to the community and have people on your farm and, and really foster those relationships. And for, for some people, that might sound really good. For other people, for a variety of completely fair enough reasons, they may not want that. And I just wonder, is it possible to do what you're doing without forging those connections and allowing people on your land? I mean, you know, for some people, just personally, their character might not be lend itself to, to hanging out with, with people on the, on the farm. Sure. Yeah, I think so. And I think it's, you know, like the Rico Rings are a great example. There's many of the other producers on the Rico Rings are benefiting from the growth of that selling modality. And that's come from people who are, you know, hyping it and, and bringing people onto their farms and getting people excited about these things. But I'd say there's room for, for everyone in that. But I, it's a lot easier to... Something that Joel Salatin always says is that really resonates with me as true is it's much easier to find a customer who will spend a thousand euros with you than finding 10 customers that will spend a hundred euros with you. Like once we've got a customer because we have the best eggs, if we suddenly produce turkey or vegetables, then they will buy those from us too. And so relationships are key. I think... Yes, you can do it if you're less sociable, but you'll be sort of jumping on someone else's bandwagon, as it were, because it's, it's about relationship marketing. That's what opens up this door that allows us to farm in a way that you couldn't have done 10, 20 years ago, perhaps, as, long, as well as the advent of social media and all these tools that we have now that just didn't exist before. But it, for me, it's really you know, it's the core of relationship marketing. That's what makes this type of farming work. And, you know, it's interesting, the Rico idea, that, you know, using Facebook, just, I mean, is it possible to say what percentage of your sales depend now on that? Oh, 100% now. 100%. Right. We, we used to do quite a lot of sales to restaurants, but this year with COVID, they all shut down. So we, everything is going through Rico for us now. Can you talk yeah. a bit more about supply chains? I mean, obviously, in every country, the supply chain situation is going to be different. Uh, you know, you spoke just there. You mentioned, obviously, restaurants would have been, you know, top of your list beforehand, and then private sellers, and obviously your dependence on social media. But just how important is it to have your supply chains established before you sort of engage in this kind of enterprise? Or is that even possible? Well... No, I don't think it's possible. Like when we arrived here in Sweden, I mean, I'm obviously from the UK, but Sweden is quite a long way behind other parts of Europe. There, there was no one doing pasture poultry in Sweden. There was no one doing no dig market growing. I think there were four CSAs in the whole of Sweden. And so there was no real market channels, but there was no competition either. You know, no one was producing good food. Like Sweden's unusual because the quality of food in the supermarkets is extremely poor, considering how rich and affluent the country is generally. Mm. And so I guess we had a fairly easy inroad because there wasn't any competition, but it's facilitated a lot of people starting up. This RICO model has now, I mean, there are six or 700 RICOs across Scandinavia moving millions and millions of euros and it's yeah it's all happened in the last three two three years really it's balloons so. that's remarkable um you one of the striking things you said in your talk was you know this idea of focusing on growing soil and then lettuces grow themselves and, and i just wonder does that concept stay in your mind for all of the crops that you produce definitely definitely it's the same i'm sure people like greg judy would have said the same yesterday it's you're not growing beef you're growing microbes and they're growing grass and the grass is translating to flesh and that's how we're farming everything and we're putting our attention on microbiology i know you've got dr christine jones talking it's you know i think all of us are saying the same thing it's putting the attention back on microbiology sean has a question sean yeah thanks richard really interested in the um, in the uh, the presentation a couple of things i want to ask you is the wood chip you're using uh is it is it hardwood softwood or is it a mix uh and does it have an impact on soil biology in our case it's spruce norwegian spruce now that's only because in sweden 
there's nothing else. We only have Norwegian spruce across 90% of the whole country. So um, it's a limitation, but it's not, it wouldn't be my preferred choice. I would like to use mixed broadleaf hardwoods, but I believe it's also got the benefit that it, it stays around a lot longer. It doesn't break down so fast. I know a friend in the UK who's using willow and it's, he has to replace it a lot faster, but that could be a disadvantage, I guess. Uh, does it affect, like a lot of people have concern with wood chips that it would rob nitrogen, but this is a bit of an urban myth that gets circulated around the internet. It's, if you look at our crops in videos, on photos, there's no visible impact at all. So. Okay, and the other thing I wanted to ask you is, I understand why we'll say um, no dig would work from a biological perspective and from the whole idea of uh, laying down carbon. From an ergonomic perspective, is it easier than a normal digging system? Definitely, definitely. So bear in mind, it's a lot of work in the beginning. We're putting down like 10, 15 centimeters of composted material to smother out weeds. But that's a one-off. We're never doing that again. So a typical thing is putting down a couple of wheelbarrows per bed per year, and that's, that's all we're actually doing so it's there's no digging and yes it's way more ergonomic way less water way less inputs uh, better drought resistance better soil biology healthier plants it's yeah it's a winner for me <laughs> Richard Perkins from Sweden thank you so much for that it was incredibly interesting to hear you talk um, we're gonna leave it there uh, just remind people if they want to connect with you on uh, social media what's your handle uh, we have quite a few now, but you can find me on YouTube, and if you type in Ridgedale Farm, you'll find us on the different forms. That's super. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us.